so we are about to roll into our fourth interview on this road trip to Philadelphia. We're gonna be talking to Christine Miles, the author of What Is It Costing You Not To Listen? The Power of Understanding to Connect, Influence, Solve, and Sell. So one of the things we're always saying here at Restaurant Unstoppable, it's kind of a common theme that's echoing is first seek to understand, then seek to be understood. And there's so much power that can come from being a good listener. I mean, I'll be honest, I, I'm, I got Christine on the show selfishly because I'm a podcaster and it's my job to listen and to be curious and to ask questions. I get a lot of requests here at Restaurant Stoppable to be a guest on the show and I, I rarely take the request, but this one really stood out to me um, just because I know how important it is to be a good listener in business. Uh, so the, the strategy, the game plan for this interview is I just wanted to get to know Christine a little bit better, have her tell her story. And then what we're gonna do is talk about the benefits of listening in business. And then hopefully she can give us some great tips. We're gonna break down five of um, the ways you can become a better listener. So that's the game plan. I think there's gonna be a ton of value in today's episode. We're all gonna be better listeners after this. I can't wait. Uh, so yeah, enjoy it. With excitement, allow me to introduce to you today's guest, consultant, executive coach, entrepreneur, and author of What Is It Costing You Not To Listen? The Power of Understanding to Connect, Influence, Solve, and Sell, Christine Miles. Christine, are you feeling unstoppable I'm today? feeling unstoppable. Yes. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to have you. Honestly, I don't, I get a lot of requests, probably 30 requests a week to be mm. a guest on the show, and it's a lot of publicists reaching out to me don't always respond i usually respond but i don't always agree um this book hit a, a chord with me uh, the title stood out especially because i'm constantly saying on the show first seek to understand then mm. seek to be understood mm -hmm. and if you just sh and just listen and can collect data and listen to your people they will give you such a wealth of information if you just listen and mm -hmm. it's so important um and this book like i said it struck a, a chord with me uh, I, I felt it just felt right. I, so I dove in and I was so happy I decided to pursue this opportunity because I love the book. I really did. It, there's so much gold in this book. Uh, I can't wait to dive into your book and the lessons you're going to teach us today. But let's get that motivational, inspirational ball rolling. And if I didn't warn you about this, <laughs> I apologize with a success quote or mantra. A success quote or mantra. Well, one of my favorite things and I wrote this in the book was was really that life is meant to be understood backwards but live forward. And I think that's obviously it ties very well to listening. It, it's what I believe. We need to self-reflect. We need to go back in conversations with ourselves, learn those lessons, but then we need to, we need to move the path forward. So I think it's, it's a daily activity. It's a, it's sometimes a moment to moment activity. And I think it's a, a very important life activity. Pull back some layers in that. So why is it so important to look back? What's going on? What are you looking for when you're looking back? Well, I, I think our past, if we let it, really informs our, f our forward. So everybody has a story. I have a story. We talked a little bit about your story before we started recording. That story influences who we are. It's how if we, this is part of listening to yourselves, when you self-reflect, when you listen to what happened, pay attention to the cues, it helps, it helps you make better decisions, you know, get more of what you want as you move forward. I don't know that we're really taught to do that. I think we're taught to keep moving forward. I'm, I mean, I'm a very goal-oriented person. I think goals are important and let's accomplish and let's do. But a lot of it is about looking at what we've done so we can move forward in a more yeah. intentional way. I feel like the Eastern culture is really good at this. They're very good at just reflecting and being mm -hmm. present. W like, what do you think is the big difference between the? And wh I, when I say Eastern culture, I almost feel like it was like the way we all were at one point. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what happened in West Western culture where it became very like, let's look forward, let's let's have a plan, let's strategize. I don't know the difference exactly. Yeah, well, I don't know that I know the difference either. I I think f for me when I look at. And again, in our, my 20s, and I had some, you'll learn a little bit more about me, I had some things happen to me in my 30s that really changed my life. But we, the American dream is to get more, accomplish more, do more. We Consume have, more. We have a <laughs> tremendous opportunity. Anytime I travel still, people are like, you have a different chance. And, and it's true. And that also begets moving faster, moving forward. You talked a little bit about your parents' restaurant and having – a lot of customers, a lot of people that came into the restaurant. And a lot of love. And that's the one thing I really remember. And it's, it's like 
th- there's so many people just loved my parents. Yeah. And they still do. But anyway, sorry. Did more, on. though, yeah. get them profitable? Did more get them a quality of life? In some ways it did. But we have to look at what's working what's not working. Uh, look backwards to look forward. Yeah. And I think that that mantra is really – it's 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 like the – a big picture mantra too. Like you're talking like on a small individual scale, mm-hmm. but I think that the answer to business in general moving forward is in studying our past. Absolutely. Uh, I mentioned this before the recording <laughs> anthropology and just figuring out how we tick and how we work and how we're meant to coexist with others. And then how do we recreate that in business mm-hmm. so we can be happier moving forward? Yeah. Uh, it's something that really drives me. I'm curious about, but this is off to a great start, but do, do tell us more about who you are and how you became <coughs> an expert in the world of listening. Well, my, my training started very young as, as you probably read about in the book. Uh, I grew up in Hershey. So in many ways, a very idyllic childhood. I grew up in the the seventies. So lots of outdoor play. How much chocolate did you get? Uh, always a lot of (laughs) chocolate. Although I lived, I lived closer to manure than actually to (laughs) the smell of chocolate. Uh, my neighborhood was at one time a farm that they turned in. So there was a very rural community. We rode our bikes everywhere. And I had a mother who had mental health issues that she came by very honestly. She had lost her mother from childbirth. The story was talked about openly and honestly. And she had a lot of psychological pain that was very much below the surface because my mother was very charismatic and attractive and fun and friendly and loving. So she lit up the room and she was in deep emotional pain most of the time that most people didn't see. And as the girl in the family, because she lost her mother, it was my job to understand that pain and fill that need a little bit. And so there was great burden in that. Mm. And there was also great gift because I learned to pay attention to that dichotomy of, of being really lighting up the room and still hurting deeply. Yeah. Well, I mean, being in tune with where your mother was, I'm sure it was important because you had to know if she was going in a direction that you had to prepare for, you know? Yeah. And she wasn't volatile at all. Okay. It wasn't that. It was more like she just didn't feel seen. Oh. She didn't feel seen. So you get you could be the opportunity to see her. That's right. It was it was expected. That yeah. was you know the therapist and I still talk about <laughs> to yeah. be honest with you, and it was it was the greatest gift. And she saw other people. She saw other people, but she felt very unseen because of not having that mother figure. Yeah, and I, it's like the third. If you're looking, I, and I echo probably Maslow's hierarchy of needs way too much. Yes, sort of like, here it goes again. <clears throat> but it's the third thing up there um, under like your physiological yeah. insecurity. Being seen is like one of the most important things. Why do you think it's so important for us to be seen? Well, and again, not an expert in this field, but animal studies show that they'll take love and affection over food. If yeah. they're if they're ostracized, uh, speaking of animals, my cat yeah. is in the room for any s- of the listeners. Yeah, Christine's house is not haunted. <laughs> if you're watching the video, just with this, cuteness, just just little kitties running around. Yeah. So if you see a sweatshirt or a wire moving on its own, there's a cat manipulating it. Under That's the table. right. She's she wants to be part of the. Uh, <laughs> she wants to be nearby at all times. So yeah. her name is Izzy. Uh, why do people want to? I think we just we seek it. We need it. It's human. We want to feel connected. We want to be noticed, and not for what we do. But for who we are mm-hmm. and how and and who we are in the world at a very emotional level. Well, you mentioned again before the conversation between the ages of eight and fourteen is when we are formed. Mm-hmm. Uh, our personalities are formed. You tell us more about that. Yeah. Well, so who going to my original statement, which is understanding the past to 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 move ahead in the future, who we are and and why we're passionate about what we do or why we choose what we do is very often starts very early in our lives. And we can remember things as early as 8 to 15 or or 14. I remember listening differently as young as 5. I can remember at 5 years old. So that's a big part of who we are. Did somebody say something to you ever uh, between those ages or acknowledge you? Later they did, but not at that age. Um, As early as high school, I had, there was starting to get some language around it. Um, but probably I just remember moments of like it's paying attention to things that, that I knew were not, that weren't probably my age range should yeah. be doing. I think it goes, I don't, I'm obviously not an expert on the subject, but I do, I, I'm, I'm very interested in the subject and I do I'd like to explore the subject. I think it has a lot to do with our need, like we're tribal animals, mm-hmm. so we need to contribute to the Absolutely. tribe. It's our purpose to contribute to the community, to the yep. tribe, because if we didn't, we'd be kicked out. Mm-hmm. They, we would be dead weight, yep. you know? So I think being seen and recognized for our strength, we, we crave it because if, if we don't bring something to the group, we're just dead weight, you know? So I think we, we all, maybe 
I don't know. Like, don't quote. Like, this is just a well, thought, yeah, but it feels no, it, right. It, you know. So, I, well, that's very interesting what you're saying because I imagine me seeing my mother helped her see me. Yeah. So, I mean, she adored me. I was, yeah. you know, so, so it was, you know, there Many was purpose. a lot of connection yeah. to that. So, and and um, and by the way, uh, my father was also quite an influence on me because he was a businessman. He started his career um, selling chicken feed after he got out of college he was an agriculture major he grew up on a chicken farm i only knew the man that sold life insurance and was a financial planner i never saw the chicken farmer he had a pickle bucket of tools that he never <laughs> used um, by the time i was old enough to remember but he was deeply connected to his clients and he knew everything about them intimately and so he shared a lot of stories talked about them understood them he was very engaged with them emotionally yeah and that also formed. He was a great listener. I love it. So at what point, like when did you have an idea of the path you wanted to take? So I didn't really, I knew at eight that I wanted to help people. And I thought I'd be a, I remember saying, I got in the car, like, what do you want to be? I want to be a psychologist. I, my mom saw a psychologist. I, yeah. I didn't really know what that meant. I just knew that that was it. I also, <laughs> in fairness, didn't have a lot of paths to choose from because math and science were not my, I know now were not my strength. Um, so so I, I knew that I wanted to help people. I didn't envision at this that young age that I would help people the way I'm helping them today. But I, I do know that the reason I only ever stood out or did anything well was because of my ability to listen differently not because of any other natural talent that I was gifted. Yeah. So you choose to go to school for psychology. Yes. I think there's a little bit of a story there. Cause there you, is. Do you want to get into that? Sure, sure. Well, I didn't take math past ninth grade algebra. So I went, Mr. Berninski did me in, no offense, Mr. Berninski, but I, algebra, <laughs> I, I know now that I have some dyslexia and that's part of why algebra just made me nuts. And I went, I'm going to run from as far that <laughs> as possible. How did you know, like in your adult life, like how did you get diagnosed with dyslexia? I was at a wedding with, um, with, a, for a friend and th there was a behaviorist who specialized in this for adults and children. And I said, I think I'm dyslexic. She goes, everybody thinks that. And th then she started asking me a couple questions. She goes, yep, you're. <laughs> what were the <laughs> questions? I guess you remember. One of them was, do you ever read for pleasure? And I said, no. <laughs> I she can said, relate that. <laughs> I, sh I said, only for information. And I don't read a book cover to cover. I have to read it. Cause I, and she, she said, People with forms of dyslexia like I have will not read for pleasure. That th That's not pleasurable to me at all. It's very painful. Yes, so but I'll study a book to understand the concepts. Yeah. yeah. So I think I'm, I mentioned to you that I'm also dyslexic, and I can totally – I mean, I'm an audio book junkie, yeah. though. The yeah, day I just The day I discovered audio books, I was like – at times, too, and people will be in the car with me and be like, how are you listening to this? I'm like, I don't know. I can just hear it. Oh, no, that's easy for me, too. Yeah. Auditory learning is much easier yeah, for me than – like, like yeah. super high speed, and yep. they're like – what is going on? I'm like, I don't know, but I can't read. That makes you feel any better. What speed? We, by the way, we tested the speed on the audiobook to see how fast you could listen to it without me sounding like a chipmunk. Did you figure that out when you uh, listened to the audio? I mean, you did sound like a chipmunk at times, too. It was like one, two, five, or something like that, I think, the speed. I, I got to bring it back to like 1.5 if I'm like jogging or doing yeah. something else because if, if I'm doing multiple things, it becomes too much to focus. But right. I mean, I. I I, I grew up, not to make this the, the story about me, but growing up, um, I remember thinking like I was a, a big old dummy. Yeah. You know, just being like, wow, like it's time for me and the other dummies to go to the other classroom. Yeah. Now. And, and, I, and I remember that that had a, to this day, it has an effect on me. I think that I can't do things like I'm not, you know, like it, it affects your self-confidence. Was that the case for you? Well, that's interesting. So. I don't know. No, I did. I I knew I wasn't the smartest, but I knew I was smart enough. Yeah. But I my, my fr I knew exactly where I was in the pecking order. Uh, but I also had a father and a mother who both really told me I was capable of doing whatever they, I thought I could do. So I didn't feel so limited by. I did avoid a lot of subjects, and t that's why I struggled to get into college. So I took. I I would thought I was going to be like a legal secretary until my senior year. And then that's only when I went into college prep course. And uh, I was terribly unprepared for the SATs and to really get myself into college. So um, it you was. went to Penn State. In there, I correct? went to Millersville oh, sorry, Miller's. undergrad. That's and then right. I went to an Ivy League school, University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania which was a big was. sell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's just like that is such, I feel like such an accomplishment. And I wanted to make sure that that came out of your Thank story. Thank you. Because it's, yeah. it's, 
it just shows if you put your mind to something and, and you have a vision for yourself and you, you can manifest that and you'll find ways like you can increase your odds of making it happen because you start manipulating the, the, your universe. You know? Well, it, it yeah, there, and she I, is. there she is. And I talk about it in the book. It was my first big sale yeah. when I got into the University of Pennsylvania because they told me no. And I, my father helped me sell otherwise that, um, that, I could, that I could get in, and he helped me write a letter. Now, the back story is, first of all, my ho- field hockey coach, because I was an athlete in college, I was a field hockey and softball pitcher, my field hockey coach wanted me, so she helped sell me into Millersville. Yeah. And then I did well at Millersville because I found my niche. It's also worth mentioning you were with, at one point a top 50 field hockey professional. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, was that's another pretty impressive story. I was, that's probably, that's interesting you mentioned. That's probably one of the things in my athletic career I'm most proud of because it's called the, <laughs> oh, it's called the Honda Broderick if, uh, Award. That was my so cat Izzy, chewing. So Izzy, if you're not watching the video, uh, when, when I said there she is, that was Izzy jumping on the table. That wasn't and me. And that, that chewing noise was not Christine chewing on the microphone. She has to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the Honda Broderick Award, I was a Division three athlete that was nominated for a Division One award so they awarded the top 10 athletes in field hockey across the country now they now you go to like espn you get a watch you get on tv i got the nomination but it was quite an honor so yeah yeah but i do think that there's a there's a lot of dyslexic people in the restaurant industry and yeah um, i think that there is a correlation generally people who aren't good um i don't know at traditional at like traditional smarts yeah as like the, the the system would call smart yeah right tend to be very emotionally and socially intelligent that's right and i don't know if there if there's a, any data to support that but i think you're an example of that somebody yeah. who struggled with math and science yep hey weird she's very emotionally intelligent yeah she can empathize she can socialize yeah and, and these are huge skills in the hospitality industry huge. so there's no huge. wonder you see a lot of that in the restaurant industry but why is it so i mean i, I don't think society does enough credit to people who, who are socially and emotionally intelligent well this is a lot of the problem we solve when we work with businesses because a lot of people get somewhere because they're technically very skilled and have the acumen and then they they struggle when they reach that level of competence and their other things are required so we know in the restaurant business that that that's required right away because it is there is a hospitality yeah. nature and a people nature to it so yeah I mean I often said it was very clever that I managed to get through college without taking any real math classes um, and I got you know into pen with without those now I did study psychology so that helped I, I didn't try <laughs> to be a rocket scientist or anything yeah I took a, a semester of, um, of Spanish and I was like, why am I doing this? Please don't torture. Make this. Yeah, T- uh, torture. That t- languages are torture. Souls, yes, Christine. we are kinder <laughs> souls. So I'm grateful to two things. I'm grateful because I had parents that said you're capable, and I'm grateful I had great coaches to help me find a, a, something that helped me thrive. If I hadn't had athletics, I would have had a hard time getting into school. Um, but uh, but yeah, the, I mean, when I went to Penn, I went, which one of these is <laughs> not like the other? Because trust me, I was like over my skis. <laughs> but by the sixth weekend, I was shining because I had experience that they hadn't dreamed of having uh, at 24. I was in a different category because I had already done a lot of things that they wanted to eventually do because I had the emotional capability that got me in. And you, when you graduated, what happened? What, where was your focus? So I graduated from Millersville, and I got two sales, I, two job opportunities. Millersville was my undergrad. It's in Lancaster between Hershey and Philly. One was a sales job, and I thought there's no way I'm going to sell um, for some reason. And the second was a home-based fa- family therapy job, uh, a pilot program through the Philadelphia Children's Hospital, which was at the time a world-renowned institution in the psychiatric world. And um, I thought, well, I'll take that job. And I was 22, knocking on people's doors, saying, hi, I'm Christine, I'll be your family therapist. That was the real sales job. I just didn't know it. I was taught how to sell in that job. That's really what I learned, how to sell myself, how to sell ideas, how to help people make changes. And I had no experience, personally or professionally, really, to speak of it, despite my background. But I stood out because I had this other thing that I listened differently. They used to say, I, they, meaning these world-renowned therapists, said, you know how to join and connect with the families very quickly. What I really did was listen to understand them very quickly, and I didn't go in with the presumption that I knew more. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is great advice, just thinking about the the server guest experience and just 
just listening and just being engaging a guest and finding out what they're looking for, what their their taste is, what yes. their the dislikes and likes, and just literally taking them on a journey based on the, what they're the data they're giving you and upselling and all this. Like if you listen and like you know what they like, and then you compare things and just but you got to collect the data first you it's have to listen huge. Yeah. i was at a restaurant the other night nothing fancy just a local like nicer uh, pub and the the bartender actually served me and i've gotten this dish before and it was like a, a steak bowl and she said do you like a lot of spice and i go mild list a little she goes great because sometimes you know when that dish came out it was absolutely the best i had ever had it now i know how to order it I was absolutely thrilled, and I thought nobody ever asked me that question before. And you know that they care enough to ask you the question, which is going to make you want to go back. Yeah, she, it was made the way I like yeah. it. I mean, she it, asked, yeah. she got ahead of it. Yeah, there's a ton of benefits to listening. Yeah, um, we're kind of we plan on getting into that. Yeah. We're gonna, so we're, the plan, and we're going to talk about the benefits of listening, uh, especially in business, to to sell, to lead, uh, to solve problems. Mm -hmm. uh, and after that, the, the plan is to kind of take you guys through the the five steps to listening better and what well, I, I don't want to put words into your mouth how would you describe the five things we're going to go over well so the i titled the book and i appreciate that stood out to you what does it cost you not to listen because i believe we have a problem that most people don't know they need to solve mm -hmm. and the solution to that which is the last third of the book the, the books in, divided in thirds for the fellow dyslexics <laughs> uh is called the listening path and that is the solution to the problem which is the path to understanding and there's five main tools on the path that I write about in the yeah. book. Selfishly, I want to listen. I wanted to listen to your book too because, as a podcaster, as somebody whose job it is to listen, I was like, I've already started using your tricks in, in my. Oh, approach. good, yeah. good. I love to hear um, that. So, yeah, I'm excited. So, anyway, I think now is a great ta uh, great time to take our first break to thank our sponsors. We have to interrupt today's video to let you know that right now, Restaurant Systems Pro is offering a no strings attached 60 day trial that will help you improve your systems increase your profit and find better work life balance all you have to do is click the link yep. below we're back and before we get into the benefits of listening i don't think i gave you enough of a chance to to talk about the transition from being a therapist to being a, a an expert on listening so yeah. make that connection and we'll talk about the benefits well you know i at eight like i said i thought i was going to be a psychologist and and i loved working with families but my father was quite an influence on me. So when I, my, I did things in reverse orders. I did a lot of things. So I, I got my undergraduate. Then I became an actual therapist with an under with only a bachelor's degree and got world renowned training. Then I got my master's. And then I went. This stuff really applies to business. How can I make that switch? So I ended up um, working for an employee assistance program. I started as which is a outsourcing if you work for a company they provide a benefit and I started as a counselor and six months later I was leading and running the organizational development arm of the small EAP going out and doing training around management training how to have a difficult conversation what if you suspected somebody was under the influence um, you know all, all these kind of organizational things all around these more what we call the soft skills and that was re I was living the dream then that's when I really started to I I thought this is great what, what made it a dream for you well you talked about loving chaos as did I so I was uh, we served 100 companies I was at a different home every day whether uh, one day was a bank the next day was a mushroom farm then it was a hospital staff and the, con the, the, the issues were always the same and largely they were around the way people communicated what was, was the issue with I'm uh, guessing people weren't listening. Well, so <laughs> that's something that I realized over time. I, too, took it for granted so much is that so much of communication training is around what's said and not what's understood. And so I was going in off and starting even early, late in my 20s in that part of my career, doing the understanding part one-on-one, -on -one, whether that was with families, whether that was business leaders, and then, you know, by 2010, fast forwarding now, I'm like, this is crazy. There's, this needs to be systematized because I'm having the same conversations over and over again. And in reality, we have zero years of education on how to listen, zero, yeah. from elementary school through executive programs. And I thought this is the thing that needs to be fixed. So I, I have always done this but what I needed what I decided needed to be done was to put this in a framework that it could be replicated yeah I was fortunate enough to actually have training in listening as a commercial pilot 
because it's one of the the things that you need to be able hmm. to because it, it's a crew atmosphere. What did that look like? I'm it's, curious. So it's a lot of repeat. <laughs> okay. So closed loop communication. You say something to me, I repeat it back to you. Okay, because you have to affirm. I would think constantly that the wherever you are on the in the cockpit you're agreeing to before yes. you take an action <laughs> yeah so uh, you want to make yeah. sure that like if you're telling me something i heard that right, right this is what you told me to do yes right right um, also it's a lot of encouraging the first officer to challenge the captain ah because it's your job to back up the captain yeah and if you're in a situation where um you're flying with somebody who doesn't like to be challenged type a personality or like hmm. i'm the captain listen to me that's not safe yeah the whole reason to have somebody there is to back you up and yeah. to offer a se- second opinion so teaching people that it's okay to be challenged that the the purpose of having somebody there is to give you that data that you might be missing. yeah 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 you know so in creating a culture uh, uh, an environment a uh, safe environment to to encourage communication well so first of all i i absolutely freaking love that yeah. <laughs> because it's the metaphor of it's a safety check could not be more on point to yeah. what i believe and i am a you know trained therapist and I've never had a course on listening I speak the I am the example that is the rule and so and I can't tell you the number of social workers I've said and therapists have you ever had listening training and they're they're like yep and then they go actually nope they just thought I I'm just I was supposed to be good at it we are put in positions to listen that doesn't mean we're doing it right or well yeah yeah, and uh, I think now is a good time to start getting into like we're, I think we're leading into that segue yeah. into the benefits of listening. So before we dive in, is there <coughs> is it possible for you to kind of like make a list of like like in your like a short list of like here like here's five benefits? Well, look at the title of my book. What's it say there? You know, connect, influence, solve, and sell. There's Sorry four I'm of them. Book as a coaster. That's right all now. right. I appreciated <laughs> that. I, I you know for those Figured not there's no the... it's okay. It's not sweating, so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> you, you got the hardback, which I appreciate. Yes, so course. so that fundamentally that's what I believe understanding does. It helps us connect. It helps us influence. And that's family, that's customers, that's fellow employees, colleagues, whomever. And it helps us sell, which we all need to do. I sold my way into Penn. Um, didn't buy my way in. I sold my way in. And it, it also helps us solve problems. Whether that's I'm talking to my spouse and th- they have a problem that I think I can help with or my teenager or somebody that comes into my restaurant. So fundamentally that list was that took me a a while to come up with that list because I wanted to make sure that the solution was also in the title so (laughs) connect influence solve uh, sell and advise yeah right there yep and solve problems yep um Jesus catch Tori well you had your cup over it so it's (laughs) how you know what are you gonna do Isabella stop I I needed I knew I needed a coaster for this interview so that's why I brought it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that never has there been a better <laughs> use for that trust me all right you ready you i'm ready right. jared if you choose to leave this i, I am be fine with it by the way i, I get no it. money from the litter <laughs> robot people but i strongly advise anybody with a cat to get that yeah awesome <laughs> all right so the list the the be- the, the benefits of listening you become more connected you become more of an influencer you can solve more problems and you can sell. So let's yeah. go down the list. Yeah. And so so I believe we are in a drought of understanding and that drought is left to a drought of connection. I hear this question all the time, you know, why are we so connected yet so disconnected? We again more, we have all these devices that connect us, but are we really emotionally and humanly connecting? We're hurting for that. We're seeing the uprise in the mental health issues. I knew with the pandemic that that was going to go, it was going to be magnified. It was going to be like a tsunami. The wave was going to go out. We weren't going to sure when it was going to come back and just rip us apart. And it's starting to happen. I'm one of the few influencers. I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole, but I'm one of the few influence. I hate calling myself an influencer, but that's what everyone else calls me. That is like, doesn't get so caught up in trying to promote more social media. Yeah. I think that I, I I lean in the, the, the direction of, we need to, put our shit away Mm -hmm. you know it's hard but but i think there's a lot of fear associated with it people are afraid if they're not active then they they won't be able to they won't be seen yeah or noticed or and it's also how we've habituated children and young people to connect and so and and i'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater by any means it's fine we can do both but it is 
we have to figure out how to do both, in yeah. my opinion. There's no um, social norms associated with how to manage a phone. It's a, it's, this word is, might be a little overused, but it's truly unprecedented. Yeah, it you is. Know, We're we in, in totally uncharted yeah. territory, for yeah. sure. Um, so in my, in my, my studies of, of talking to these restaurant tours, the, the, just the, the importance of letting people be seen and heard and mm -hmm. contribute is a mm -hmm. big part and knowing that every one of your employees has something to offer. Yep. But if you don't open that door, if you don't let it be known that we want to hear from you, yep. we want like, and you don't schedule the time to make it happen. Yep. So like it's up to the, the upper management to, to one, let the door be open, mm -hmm. communicate that, but two, to make time yep. to let people talk to you. And you'll be so, so amazed at That's the crazy. problems that, I mean, we're getting ahead with problem solving, but. Well, and selling is, a, is also the ability to give advice. You just talked about that in your pilot training. Like, can I advise the captain, right? right. <laughs> so how do we do that? How do we challenge? Challenge is a form of selling. Yeah. I'll, I'll go psychological with you because I, I studied group process in grad school. And so if you as a restaurant owner aren't talking with your staff and team, there will be a mirroring process where that goes down to the customer level. It's just social norms. There is tons and tons and tons of research on just that, that two groups that live simultaneously but don't actually overlap with each other will behave similarly. Yeah. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why um, this idea of, of connection, if we're talking about connection, I love uh, EOS. I don't know if you're familiar with the, the entrepreneurial operating system. Um, Traction is the book. Okay. Maybe Gino Wickman. Oh, yeah, yeah. Might okay. Ring a bell. So, uh, we ha we've had Gino on the show. We're actually going to be talking to Mike Payton, uh, mm. his co-author. Um, mm. And the you have to bake listening into your business. Yeah. And the way you do that is with weekly meetings, daily pre-shifts. Mm -hmm. um, like, do you want to continue this thought? Yeah. Well, so I'm going to take a step back to that because a lot of people go on listening tours, and or I'll go. I'll talk corporations now. Like, we have an issue. Let's let's do a listening tour. Let's go around and make sure we're listening. I'm like all for that, as long as you've given yourself how to listen before you do that, because you can set up meetings that are or mechanisms or discipline in your day where you're listening. That if you're not doing it well, I can go practice golf at the driving range and pract my s practice my swing the wrong way, and guess what? I'm going to get worse. Yeah. So while I agree fundamentally that that's something we have to build in and do, we also need to make sure we're prepared well to do it well so that we're creating an outcome that is positive and not negative. Because if you go in to listen and you don't do that well, you're worse off, not better that's off. That's a great teaser for the next part of this interview. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna go through the how to do it well. Yeah, we're gonna teach us how to do that. Yeah. Um. So around this idea of connecting, and I, before moving away, I want to another thought came into my mind. A way to bake it into your business. Uh, I like the, the word bake, by the way. That's very on metaphor yes. for the restaurant <laughs> business, right? Uh, it <laughs> is. Uh, but the the one I think it was um, his name is escaping me. Mike Ganino mentioned this to me when I was talking to him. That the best question you can ask your team uh, or the best number you can track, I think is the way it goes, is uh, on a scale from one to five, how are you feeling today? Mm -hmm. And just, and they, and it, you can literally bake this right into your business yes. uh, when people check out yes. or check out clock out. Yes. Um, just, at, just on a scale, you get to do this before you clock out. That's awesome. And little things like that it can bring your attention. Now, you know, you if somebody gives you a two, now you need to make time to find out what's going on. Can I... Can I point out to your listeners what's so different about that question that they may not notice? Please. It's not how are you doing, it's how are you feeling. Mm. That's whether the one to five there is not, it, do, it matters and doesn't matter. It's how are you feeling. That is a very rare question that people ask one another and one that is part of, of listening differently. Yeah. So we, we, what I hear a lot of is that feels like an intrusive question. Am I allowed to ask people how they're feeling? What if they don't want to tell me or if they're private? And I go, it's the best question nobody will notice you ever asked and will all l likely answer. It's very powerful when you ask people how they feel, not how they're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So around this idea of connecting, um, the benefits of listening is to help you connect. Uh, did you want to go deeper into that is there anything we, we didn't yeah well i think you know it makes sense right and it's 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 just it's just the basis for how we connect humanly and when we connect we do have more ability to influence if you don't trust me why would i be able to influence you 
yeah. right? That's the first step to it. So it does build from there. Now I'm influencing you. Now now have I got enough credibility that I can actually help you solve your problem or sell to you. I feel like it, it helps build trust. What's the first thing you do when you go to a, I don't know, like when you're in college or when you're getting a new job or you're in a group of strangers, icebreakers. Yeah. And the, what's the purpose of the icebreakers is to find connection. That's right. You know, it's to find mutual, like, oh, I like basketball too. Or, yeah. oh, I did that. And like, as soon as you sh- start to share common goals or interests. That's right. It helps you get closer to that person. Well, what we realize is we have more in common than we uh, we have differences. And too much of the world, especially in the digital world, is focused on what we're how we're different, not how we're the same. So when we build those icebreakers or do those kind of fun things that we do to connect, we're going, oh, you're more like me than I thought. We Do we not look kind of different? I mean, you and me. Uh, so Hello. does that mean, <laughs> but what do we find out? We're both dyslexic, right? Yeah. You like, you're active. I'm active. You like to ride a bike. I like to ride a bike. There's, we could go on and on. Our families, you know, whatever. So that that's what we don't do naturally. So we do have to build those things in sometimes. Uh, in these kind of icebreaker ways, or we could just show up and 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 operate that way and, and get to know people yeah, and build it. that trust quickly. So influence, that's the second item on your cover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, influence, to, to help, connect, and influence. Did we talk about influence enough yet? Did we really pull back the layers on that? Well, I mean, what is influence, right? It's, it's uh, do I want to be an influencer? You, you, you called yourself, some people call you an influencer. I don't what? Like that. I, I, that's a, that's a given title, not a chosen title. Yeah, well, <laughs> and I, I think that's wise and healthy <laughs> for on your part. That does, but why are you influencing? How are you, let's do it this way. How are you influencing people? Is it all the things you're going out and talking about and saying, or is it the stories you're getting from other people and how you're bringing that to light? Is that the power of your influence? I like to think so. Yeah. yeah. So, so, you know, when you listen, you influence without even having to tell anybody anything. Because you help them feel seen, you help bring their them to the world in a different way, and then they give you a lot of credit for that. It's yeah. kind of nice. Yeah. So is that the answer to it helps you influence? Is it literally that? Is that? Is, is I it believe that so. Yeah. yeah. I think I think we're we're more powerful when we're paying attention to others than when we're paying attention to ourselves. It's interesting when you when you say the word influence, you think of somebody who's a, a teller. You know. Do you? Like, I think, yeah. Like <laughs> okay. When I, when I think of an influencer, like it's somebody who you know is out there, like trying to get you to do something. You know, and well, I guess technically I am. I mean, my mission statement is to, to inspire and empower. Sure. I'm trying to transform the industry and transform the world. It's a it's a task. Okay. <laughs> so I and so this can be used for good or evil. Yeah. So uh, let's look at Hitler, for example. Great influencer. Not you know not not outcomes I was wishing I don't know for. How I feel about being compared to Hitler. Well, not I'll you per se, but influence. <laughs> so so that's a. <laughs> let's make sure I'm not marrying those two playing. together. So, but when you understand your audience, whether that's one or thousands or millions, you have more influence over them. When you know what their needs are, what their goals are, what they have to say, that helps you be an influencer. It's, it's a, it is an inside out kind of way to think about it. It's a very it. emotional thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. people act on emotions. So if you know what, what drives them, mm-hmm. you can, I hate to say use the word use, but you can use that information to tailor the message. You can. And, you know, what I believe is that most people aren't wired that way and that there's always been evil in the world and people, w- but the reality is most of us want to do the right thing. Most of us want to give. Most of us want to help others feel seen. And I mean, you're making a really good point. And it's a lot of the powers, the higher powers that are aware of this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why they like data so much. Absolutely. Because they're listening without you even knowing. Yes. And they know what makes you tick. That's right. And they are giving you signals without you even knowing it's happening. And this is one of the, this is, we're going back to the whole social media thing. Yes. But like, it's that and and it's existed always. There's, there's been alter, ulterior motives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ulterior motives from the top for a long time. And they don't want us to know what their agenda is. Right. Well, and the social media is to to sell you stuff. Right. So, so that's. Again, it's part of the machine. I, I, I would rather have interpersonal AI. I'd rather know you so I understand. Interpersonal, <laughs> interpersonal AI? Right. I want to know I want to know who you are. If I if I listen well, then I know you mm. and then I can really I can I can help meet your needs and, and be better serve you better, whether that's in a restaurant or in a business or in my as a partner, as a parent, as a as a friend. That's what 
I'm, I think is the most powerful way to impact the world. I love it. Um, can we wrap up influence? Sure. All right. Moving on. Uh, the third item that being a better listener can help you with is solve. How does being a better listener help you solve? Well, here's where, and this will also marry to the conversation about why, how to listen differently. Most of us in an effort to be helpful, try to solve problems. And we tend to do that way too soon before what I would say we earn the right to do so. And so I'll take the example of, you know, your wife in your case has a, has a problem and they come home and they talk about that problem or she, she comes home and talks about that problem. What do you want to do? You want to help her. So let me tell you what you should do. Let me advise you. Let me tell you how to solve that. And she's going, no, 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 just, could we just let, could you just listen to me? I don't want you to solve it. That is not just a men are from Mars, women are from Venus thing. That is a problem in every business and every conversation that happens. People problem solve before they listen to understand and that wastes a lot of time a lot of resources a lot of energy and people feel less connected in that realm than more connected yes um this brings up one of the reasons why i was really excited to air your episode close to tom's episode tom Mm. sterner who his episode went live the week before your episode goes live um to listen it's almost to do it well you almost have to be in a meditative state in the sense that you have to shut your consciousness, your, 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 you know, your subconscious off. Right. And that, that voice that's running in your head, you got to tell it to shut up and just, and get almost into like a meditative state and steer your focus to what the other person is saying. And just listening to understand is, I almost like it, it has to be somewhere up in that frontal lobe. Like, like well, the brain is the enemy, I believe, is the greatest enemy of listening because it tells us to do everything but listen. Yeah, I, I, I know. I feel like this is like a social experiment. You're <laughs> like, okay, we're going to do a podcast on listening. I'm going to have my cat playing in the background with that toy over there. <laughs> I'm, and, I'm, and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm being distracted on a podcast about listening because there's a cat playing well, this with is a, life, a though, right? Toy. This I, is life. I don't know if you caught it, but I totally, like, for like five seconds was over well, there. Well, she, like, again, she's way cuter <laughs> than me, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, anyway, I was like, this is, this is irony if I've ever heard it. Um, so sorry. Back. That's to okay. Yes. Yeah, so so that's that's what creates the disconnection, though. Yeah. Is even though I'm trying to be helpful, I'm actually turning you away from me because you're trying to help me when I didn't in a way that I didn't ask for. Even if you're right, by the way. Yeah. But and now you're gonna th- while they're talking to you. While they're giving you the solution, you're thinking to yourself, this son of a bitch didn't even listen to anything I just said. I, I was a therapist my first career. I, <laughs> I suffered. For, I went, I would sit down with people and I go, how do you want me to help you? Yeah. Uh, you know, listen, listen. How do you want me to help? I want you to tell me what to do. And I would start to tell them. And you know what they do? That's not right. Argue. Argue. Yeah. yeah that's, I can't do that. What do you, and I went, wait, I, I know I asked you. And then what <laughs> I realized is human nature. Guess what? I don't want to be told what to do. Yeah. Humans don't like to be told what to do. So, you know, to go back to your point about the meditative state, the brain says to solve, the brain says to tell, the brain says to l- look at the cat. Mm-hmm. Um, a medita- we, ha- we do have to calm the subconscious down because the subconscious brain has all these distractions. And in the absence of the tools, if you just go in, you try to white knuckle it, most people can't get into a meditative state. M- people might think I'm in a meditative state. I'm just doing what I wrote about. At speed, like an Olympic athlete, mm-hmm. all right, you're not going to start out as an Olympic athlete. You're going to start out like Tom Brady can throw a football, and so can I. He can do it a lot better than me because he knows exactly how to do it, and he's practiced it to death. Yeah, he doesn't have to think about it. He just does it. That's right. So yeah. I'm in that category, but I promise you, I've gotten better even having to write about it because it's helped me be even more aware of what I'm doing. And um, and the tools work every time to calm the subconscious. I mean, ironically, I, I would say I'm not a good listener unless I'm doing an interview or I'm on a date. Oh, you okay. know, because I sure because I've, no, <laughs> because I've learned that if if like a big part of being on a date is just being interested in the other person and you i know betcha. it's, it's going to increase my odds so uh, i got a lot of second dates when i was <laughs> dating for that very reason yeah. and i thought i am tremendous and then i went oh it's not me they like how i'm making them feel i better i had to actually work at not listening so well right so unless i'm like unless i'm just like like in it to listen yes i, I am not a great listener but it's i can hard. turn it on it's, it's hard it's it's t- it's we do. I did three interviews the other day. That's four, six hours of intense. Were you listening. exhausted? I was. I told Sam afterwards. I was like, I'm 
beat. It's exhausting. Yeah. yeah. Now I so it, partially because you're partially because you're white knuckling it. That makes you more tired. By the way, I feel like you have to almost white knuckle it to stay engaged for two hours in a conversation. Like I'm going to help you. <laughs> the book helps. It yeah. hel- it's the beginning, but it's not the. Well, it, it's not all the practice. It's not entirely true. I'm passionate about th- the the topic, and I enjoy the conversation. I in- truly enjoy talking to yeah. people. So it's I enjoy the process, and it's something that I'm interested in. Like I'm very interested in. It's easy for me to talk to you and listen to you right now because this is a s- subject I'm interested. Yeah, in. sure. Well, it's it's also because you're being present and you're. You, you're wearing two hats. You're listening and you're got, you, you also have to think about the interview and your audience. You have a lot going on. I've been in your seat, so to speak. But it's, um, being present is, is a different state. What I will say, though, is when you're trying to focus without the help that you, that you need with the tools, it does make it harder. Right? <laughs> oh, my. Uh, Izzy's trying to unplug Did she it. unplug it? Oh, no, boy. You can't make it up. <laughs> this doesn't happen in the restaurant. Do, do people have dogs in the restaurant? Sometimes, Sometimes. I guess. Honestly, yeah. like, I, I love the chaos. Like, she's not bothered. Le- uh, well, she, that's good. I don't know how I wouldn't I'm be able to stop her. I'm hoping that Izzy gets me, like, 20 more, like, YouTube subscribers because everyone's going to go subscribe. To <laughs> well, see let me tell you, time. she is very cute. So <laughs> she's very cute. So it's very I can appreciate why that's a long time to and it's tiring. People, when we do our workshops, people will be like, I'm exhausted. I go, yeah, you're, because your brain has only been trained to do other things. Mm-hmm. So if I said, let's go skiing for the first time, and I put you on the double diamonds, you'd be tired after going down the mountain. Right. Oh, I have actually a, a, I have a friend who never went skiing once, and he went down a black diamond the first time. He did it backwards. Oh, boy. And it was just to survive. I'm sure. And people thought he was like amazing skier. He's like, that was the first time I've ever skied. <laughs> you thought he was amazing because he went down backwards? <laughs> yeah, he was just, he didn't know how to turn around. <laughs> That's so, funny. Uh, anyway, um, how to sell, listening to sell. Well, so what Zig Ziglar said we're all selling, mm-hmm. right? So we are, we're, we're selling the ideas we have. We're selling, you know, we're selling when we're in our restaurants. We're, we're selling when we're with our spouses. So it's important, you know, kids nowadays selling themselves into college they're selling you have to sell yourself to get a job you have to sell yourself when you walk up to that table so the sooner you get your arms around that the more you'll realize listening can help you do it without feeling like you're selling yeah i mean i i feel like i get back again to the server guest experience yes you know like we're constantly s- selling but i think i made that point when we first started they got to listen to know what what they want to that's be able right. to sell it to them that's right um, or not sell it to them yeah because right. sometimes that's that's yeah, the that's right good. answer, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, especially if they have uh, some kind of um, what's the one uh, allergy. Yeah, right? like, yeah. You know, that's definitely a a, a, w- a way to make sure they never come back. That's right. Right. That's so, right. Um, I think that one's almost like, like you you need data to sell. You need data to persuade. You need to understand before you can make your case. Yeah. And that's what what comes to my mind. And like, listening gets you that data. Is there more to it when it comes to selling or can we take a next break? No, I think we should take a next break. Right, next break. We're going to thank our sponsors. We'll be right back to talk about the five ways or what's your what's your tagline for this? This is the the listening path. The tools the listening on the path. listening path to understanding. We're going to bust it out. We'll be right back. All right. Um you are she and she's a total. <laughs> she's trying if to I fall asleep, out, so I'm gonna leave her alone. Yeah. <laughs> if I got the game out, she'd be worse. Oh, so before we come back, um, you, you obviously there's gonna be a call to action at the end. Mm-hmm. But do you want to work the game in before that? Like, or can I use that to call to action to bring people's awareness? Um, to? we're not, not yet. Uh, we'll stick with the book. I I'd like to talk to you at some point about this. This is this is only with customers, but we're gonna sell it to schools. So do you not want to bring it up? I, I would bring up that we're working on the game, but it's not there. Okay, so at the end, when I say yeah. like <clears throat> anything you want to let us know before okay. we say goodbye. Yeah, that's perfect. <clears throat> so um, when I come back in, how do you want me to, to, to pitch this? Um, let's see. In terms of making the switch? to Yeah, the so when I come back, we're going to cover these five um, bullets, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So how, what, what, what's the, the tagline? Let's talk about the listening path. The listening path. So the first the first bullet is the listening path. The listening path is the entire solution. The map is the first tool. Okay, so there's four elements to the listening path. Five. So utilizing um, six most powerful questions, reflecting to in the thirty to ninety seconds, affirming um, affirming understanding, 
mm-hmm. and then the mini reflection. Yeah, you missed the first one, which is the path to the story, which is oh, the okay. map. So I can talk through that, though. The path to the story? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sorry about that. Well, that's okay. I'll, t- I'll talk about the metaphor of why it's the path is really where I should go first. Okay. So when I come back, I'll say, we're going to take, you're going to take us on the five steps to the listening path that makes a better listener. Sure. Yep. Okay, cool. <coughs> All righty. We are back and now we're going to figure out how to become better listeners. You're going to take us on the listening path, which is five. There's a stop. There's five stops along the listening path. There's five. There's five main tools or foundational tools on the listening path. Got yes. Um, what is the first tool to the listening path? Well, let me tell you the story of, of the path first okay. and then we get the, the tools will make more sense. Got it. So. So as I said, there's zero years of education on listening. So we're told to listen from a young age, but we're rarely taught. And if we're taught, we're rarely taught how. So most people associate any kind of listening with what's called active listening. And active listening means I'm going to show you that I'm paying attention. I'm going to, I'm going to look at you and your body language. I'm going to empathize with you. I'm going to ask really good questions. I'm going to repeat what I hear. How am I doing? You're doing fine. Yes. You're doing more than fine. <laughs> uh, that tells you what to do but not how to do it, and I think it really underachieves because, again, it doesn't really help me understand that you understand me. So it's really a b- listening to understand means I'm going to understand you and the meaning of what you just told me. I'm going to uncover something or discover something. So the analogy is you wouldn't go backpacking on a trip for two or three weeks without any tools or supplies. You wouldn't go into the woods that way. We call this the conversational woods. Conversations have windy paths, they're tricky. We, it's uncharted territory and we need to know how to navigate in the woods and have the right tools and supplies to be able to stay on the main path without getting lost to the understanding. Got it, so the destination is understanding. It is, an insight, yep. So we got our backpack, we got our gear, you got ready to go. Take us on, take us on the path. So, so one of the things about being a really good listener, we call it, metaphorically, we call it, you need to be the guide in the conversation. You need to show the person talking where they need to go to get to the insight. We are wired to learn in stories. We are not naturally good storytellers. So most people start in the middle. <laughs> They don't really start at the beginning. They start with the problem or they start with where they're in the middle of their day or in the middle of the issue. So the listener's already disoriented. They don't know where they are. So the first tool on the metaphoric listening path is you need to have the map. You need to have the GPS system. If you don't have a map, you don't know where you're going to even begin to go. So that map is the main path to the story. So that's tool one. Got it. Okay. So, you know, honestly, like, when I started getting into this, I got really excited when I got to the back of your book because this is like where I can take some stuff and yeah. start applying it to what I do. And not to toot my own horn, but like I do this naturally. That's with good. The podcast. Every interview that's not with a, an, an expert like yeah. you is with a restaurant tour, and it's always like, when did you know that this was going to be your career? And that's why? right. So it's like, where did it start? Where did it start? Right. And, and then from there, it's like, okay, let's go. Yes. And like, what were your challenges? That's How'd right. How'd you overcome it? That's right. And it's just like, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but I mean, it's just, I, I feel like we're getting ahead of this. Well, just, you are and you aren't. It, so th- there's the main path. And we, so here's the other thing your listeners need to know. When you're listening, you are always gathering a story. Mm-hmm. Whether that story is 30 seconds or 30 minutes, it's a story. Mm-hmm. And stories have a trajectory. So those stories are beginning, which is what you just distru- talked about, struggle, yeah. right? Tipping point, or, and we call it a new beginning because we believe stories evolve, they don't really end. In a very rudimentary way, the, this would be described as a beginning, middle, and end, okay? But we don't think in stories when we're listening. We, we may think in stories when we tell, but very few people are good storytellers as well. So what you're doing is you're thinking about the story that you're gathering, and that's why you're thinking about, where am I in the story? And that's why you are oriented in some way. Most of us are playing spin the tail on the donkey, have a blindfold on, and somebody just turned us around, and we're just starting to walk. My orientation is the timeline. 
Mm-hmm. I'm always asking about dates, so I know That's where right. in the story we are. So I know, oh, we're still 30 years ago. That's right. I gotta fast forward. So you're on the you, that would be the map. You're on yeah. the path. You're picturing the metaphoric path in the woods and saying, where am I and which milestone? So there, that's the second tool. The four milestones to a story, the ones that I just described, the beginning, struggle, tipping point, and new beginning. Sometimes stories are fully formed, that they go from beginning to new beginning, and sometimes we haven't gotten to the tipping point. A lot of people are still in the struggle mm. because yeah. they don't know what, they don't know, they don't have a solve, mm-hmm. or I don't know what I want for dinner. You're still in the struggle. You're, you're deciding between three dishes. Tell me which one I should get. Which wine should I pair with it? You're in the struggle. Got it, got it. Do, does it usually take long or should we pause <laughs> as I'm saying this? I was going to say, should we just like wait? To, to the, it's yeah. I don't well, it's not that big an error. I think he's leaving. That was my thought. I was yeah. looking. I was like, oh, yeah. these are cute you can't backyards. Again, you can't make it up, right? I figured he could have. <laughs> I was like, if we just wait a minute or two, you might be done with it and we can continue. Um, oh, there, he's next door. Is that okay? It's better. Is yeah. that okay? I just figured if it was going to be like sure. 30 seconds, we'd wait. Sam's like, oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> just roll with the punches. Maybe the cat will go to the bathroom again. <laughs> do you want me to try to do a shout out for the lawnmowers? No, you're totally fine. I just figured, I, I, I noticed there were small backyards. So yeah. I didn't want to like um, force <laughs> it. Uh, I think we can go to the next tool. Okay, yes, we All can. Right, so the second tool in our, our is it in our backpack? So it's Am the third. So okay, what's third tool. Th- I'm going to test you now. Ready? The first tool is? The map. The map. The second tool? Is a lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, that four, the four stops on yes. that on that path. <laughs> that was really funny. Yeah. So 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 in the book, I talk about those together, which yeah. is why you think they're one. <laughs> We've learned that decoupling those a little bit helps people when they learn, but they associate to each other. So the first tool is a map. The second tool is a path. Is the the, the f- is the stops the on stops, the map? The stops. Thank yeah. You very much. Yeah. So in the book, they're written together. So you're correct. So. Um, so that, okay, so the next would be utilizing the six most powerful questions. So we call that the compass. Again, now I want you to stick with the metaphor. You're in your <laughs> backpack, so how do you make sure you stay oriented the main path when, remember, there's all these side trails, and if you don't know where you are, you may take a right when you should have taken, we're dyslexic, this yeah. happens to us all yeah. the time. And by the way, the irony that I've written a metaphor about a map when I can get lost in a circle is kind of funny. Conversations, I know exactly where I am. You put me out on the highway, I'll get lost in two, yeah. <laughs> two seconds. We got Sam sitting over in the corner he's been stuck in a car with me for a few times now I think uh, he can vouch. yeah you, you feel that <laughs> frustration i get it so i've never been in a serious car accident though. yeah so well it's like, it's just that we do imagine before we had gps like i was i i grew up in that era yeah. it was impossible to find out where you were going the the compass is your part of your gps system mm-hmm. you will get off the main path if you don't have questions that help you stay oriented so we know that asking questions is an important part of being a great listener but questions also interfere with listening so the questions that I ask may have nothing to do with your story may take us off into side trails into the woods where we get completely lost that take us off the path so the six most powerful questions that are the part of the compass are the questions that keep you oriented to the path. And they're the ones that the most expert listeners, really good listeners use. Journalists, therapists, podcast interviewers, radio shows. We talked about Howard Stern. Mm-hmm. He, he uses these questions very, very frequently. The best ones do. And we can go over that list if you like. I haven't committed them to memory, but I know the first one is what's, where's the, where's the beginning? Take me back to the beginning. To where the beginning. did this start? You said, I think in dates, that's helping you anchor. That's one of the things. Most people go forward, not backwards. Tell me what happened next versus take me back. Mm-hmm. That it's, it's the opposite that what most people think about doing. Yeah. So the f- if the first is take me to the beginning, what's the second question? The second is tell me more, right? Just how about you tell me more? Um, it's amazing what people will tell you when you ask them to tell you. Yeah. Without saying, tell me more about that or tell me more about this certain, it's just tell me more and then stop. Yeah. So, I mean, I, again, when I went through this, I'm, I'm tooting my horn again. I was like, I feel like I, I, I instinctually do this. Yeah. Because um, I'm always looking, I, I call it pulling back the layers. Right. It's like the first answer is never the first answer. Never the first yeah, and it's like the answer is after I ask you to tell me more a fourth or fifth time. Or That's right. Sixth time. However, this is counterintuitive for most people. So this is not what we're taught. We're taught to tell. 
we're taught to know, we're taught to be curious, but not in an open-ended, let, let it come to me way, in a way that I'm supposed to make it, you tell me, yeah. or I'll tell you. So this is like in sports, I remember I was in eighth grade as a, as a field hockey player, and I was being coached at a camp, and we were, this is when field hockey was played on grass at that age, um, hard to do. And they wanted us to pull the ball back. Well. When you're in junior high, pulling the ball back in, in sports is not intuitive. Everybody's just, yeah, you're trying to, to get to the goal. When I pulled the ball back, my coach went crazy because we had been practicing, like good crazy, like yeah. amazing, blah, blah, blah. Well, that reinforced that for me. When you pull the ball back and then you move the ball across, you get down the field faster, but it's not instinctual. And conversationally pulling, this is pulling the ball back. Take me back is to pull the ball back. Tell me more without shaping what I'm saying is a pull the ball back to get down the field faster. What's the third question? Well, you already brought this up with your earlier example, which is, um, which is how does that make you feel? Yeah. It's an important question that most people don't ask. Why is it important? Well, when we're – so stories have – and this is on the map as well. Stories have two parts of the narrative. They have facts and feelings, good stories. If I always say a story without facts is called a PowerPoint <laughs> – or part of you, without feelings, is called a PowerPoint. And a story where your five-year-old or four-year-old has fallen and they come in and they're just crying and it's all feelings, yeah. it's not a story either because you're trying to figure out the facts. Yeah. Most of us chase facts, not feelings. Mm. So, so if we're not asking the feeling questions, A, we're missing the character in the story, the people, because people feel, and we're missing the connection opportunity. Yeah. Um, so the, f the fourth... So the fourth question is what happened next or then what happened? So now I could say, you said it, you might have to ask tell me more a few times to get all of it, but there's a, there's a tipping point where that question needs to move to, I gotta move you along the path now. Now I'm ready for, okay, then what happened? Now I'm moving you forward on the path. Yeah, and then the fifth is a tipping point. Right. The the fifth question. Yes. Is no, no, that's the path. That's the path. Sorry, the I'm all over the place. That's all right. The <laughs> third the third stop is the tipping point. The fifth question won't feel like a question to your listeners, so hang in there with me. That is, hmm. Now I know you do this because you've already done it. Hmm. It's like it's the tell me more. That is the nonverbal tell, almost nonverbal. It's almost imperceptible when you're listening well. People go, hmm, and nod you on to tell you to tell you more without saying the question, tell me more. So it's just kind of like a, it's like a, almost like a, it's like in our coding. It's, we, a, that, it's that's in that's our human coding. That's my way I want more. Well yeah, said, yeah. well said. Uh, I may steal that. Is that okay? Please. All right. As long as you just give me props. All so right. You should listen to I I'll have stuff. you sign a disclosure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the next. The, the last but not least is where you ask again about the feelings. So there's two questions about feelings, and the rest are all situational questions or fact questions. The, the six questions is it sounds like you felt. So it sounds like you felt frustrated. It sounds like you were elated. It sounds like you're distracted. You know, whatever the feelings are, it's a fill in the blank. Sometimes people name the feelings. More often than not, they don't. So we either, either have to ask them to name them or guess at what we think they're feeling. Uh, and when we insert that, I think you felt this way, they'll either tell you, oh, no, I didn't feel that way. I felt this. Perfect. Now I know. Or, yeah, yeah, that's how I felt. Yeah. And Perfect. this is the closed loop communication. This is now like you're reading back, but you're paraphrasing. Just on feeling so far, though. It's important that we're only at making sure we're asking what the feelings are. So sometimes you're not using the feeling word, so I have to, I may, like, so for example, this is one, when one, one thing interviewers will do or journalists, something tragic happens and they go, how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. That makes me bristle because I, w I can imagine how they feel. I might say something, this is a more important time to say something like, you just you just lost a loved one. You must be reeling. That's mm. different than how do you feel? Well, uh, you know, isn't yeah. it kind of like you can kind of say it's kind of obvious. So when s when you're not certain um, or you are certain, you can fill in the feelings. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. Nobody's going to get offended. At least you're curious about the feelings. Got it. So is that all five, or do we miss? That's all six. So all six. Okay. Take me back. I tell I me <laughs> more. How did that make you feel? Right. What happened next? Hmm. And it sounds like you feel. I actually counted six. I was like, did I get too many down here? So uh, we have five um, 
tools. Five in tools. Six questions. Yes, we do. So I got my my list confused. Well, we're not bit. good at math. No. So I didn't. That was the fact that you counted that high was impressive to me. <laughs> thank you very much. So I mean, it, how much does that add up to? Oh, uh, eleven. 12, thank you. <laughs> I almost said twelve. See, point <laughs> point proven. So okay. So wh- where do we just to kind of tie this back to the restaurant industry? What where does where do we use this to? Where do we ask these questions? Yeah. Like when I think when we're trying to f- solve a problem. Right. And we know that the team has the problem. We go, we just start. What's your perspective? What's your perspective? And you collect the data. Right. But this is, these questions are the tools you can put in your, in your arsenal of of just like, you know, like your, your tool bag of, of how to get that data, the questions to ask. So you're thinking this internally versus even, we, it it applies to both, but you're asking the question related to the internal team, not the, how they're relating to the customer. Mm. So it might be, Hey, where did this problem start? Take me back. Oh, yeah. Like if there's a mistake. Absolutely. Right? Like yeah, let's blame others. No. Right. <laughs> no. <laughs> really, but we're getting at root cause, which is why problem solving is a big part of this. When we go forward, we don't look at root cause. So in order to find root cause, we need to find out the beginning and the struggle Yeah. instead of rushing to solve it. So that's really where we're focused on those two first stops on the map. So let's give the listeners some situational awareness. Uh, we're covering the, the listening path. Uh, there's... F- Five tools in our backpack for the listening pad. Yes. We're on the second tool That's right, right now, which is the six questions. That's right. The six questions are take me back, tell me more, how did that make you feel, what happened next, uh, mm. hmm, and it sounds l- like. You feel. You feel. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yep. Uh, and that's called the compass. And the reason this is important for your listeners to associate the tool is that it will help you remember so if I'm picturing the map and the four stops, I'm picturing just that, a map to the conversation yeah. and where I need to stop on that journey. If I'm picturing the compass, I'm going, oh, those compasses are the questions that help me stay on the path. So when we, when we associate that way, that help, we know from a lot of experience at doing this, we meaning my, me and my team, that people learn faster. Got it. So let's go to the, the next tool in our bag. Okay. Which is number three. Uh, reflecting in 30 to 90 seconds. So this is what we call the flashlight. So so I often say this, that the m- we know storytelling is a powerful way to tell people things, and people learn in stories. The most powerful story you can tell someone is their own. Why is that? It's how we help people feel seen. So when you tell me my story that you just listened to, I, I feel like you see me, as long as I combine that with the facts and the feelings, right? So, so this is a way to tell somebody else your own, their own story. And this is very powerful um, because it's a very rare experience throughout the day that we get this. Yeah. So when we say the flashlight, I'm going to shine a light on the important parts that you just told me and summarize it back to you. Okay, so this is where I got my wires crossed because mm-hmm. I knew this was a part um, in, the, in the research that the repeat is really important. That's right. So there's repeating looks a lot of different ways. So repeat can be, I'm going to parrot back what you exactly said to me. That sounds like that was close to your training, okay, in, in the p- cockpit. Yes. Because it's very fact-driven. Yeah. And right. One of the reasons why I'm no longer a pilot because yeah. I'm not good at probatum. Yeah, so <laughs> and and – it, and what happens is you'll feel like, yeah, you heard the words, but you don't get the meaning. Well, it happens a lot in the kitchen, too. It, sure. Because uh, if you have the expat or the chef calling things out, it's the same thing. You're supposed to call it back, yes. the order back. Yes. Which is why I could never work in a kitchen Yeah. Like that. I would yeah. get, like, the first two things on the list and be like, can you say that again? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they have to move fast. Yeah. And, yeah right. It would not be. Right. Good. So this is not a parroting back. This is a summary. So now picture the flashlight. You get it out. Now I'm going to walk. I'm going to take you back and walk the trail that you just walked with me. And I'm going to say, here's the beginning. So let me, we talked before your, the interview started and you said, so I grew up in the restaurant business, right? My parents had a restaurant. It was my daycare. (laughs) (laughs) So that was your beginning. Yeah. Right. And um, then you talked about, I don't know, we didn't get into what you did in college and ha- what you did from a career standpoint, but I figured out you were a pilot. Yes. So somewhere you went off to a different thought, 
you weren't going to do what your parents did. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let you. They <laughs> thought you're t- it's like being an actor. Did you, you learn nothing growing up in a <laughs> restaurant? Right. So you thought, let me get away from this based yeah. on their advice, and yeah. you went into a totally different realm. So I would imagine that's part of the struggle because your happiness wasn't really fulfilled in that way, even if you enjoyed part of it. I wanted to be a pilot because I wanted to be able to go anywhere. Okay. I wanted to be able to get away. You wanted to explore. Not a good reason to become a pilot. Well, well, a good reason for then, but maybe <laughs> yeah. not a long-term reason. Exactly. So I'm going to imagine somewhere your tipping point became, maybe I'm not going to own a restaurant, but I'm going to figure out how to make an impact on the restaurant because I know the, the importance, and you shared this, that it's the second largest industry in the world, and that, no pun intended or pun intended, it feeds everything we do. Yeah. So you saw the mission in that and decided to create your podcast to evangelize how you can help business owners and help them be unstoppable in the restaurant. Bravo. Well done. What a good list. Have you ever ever told you you're just such a good listener? I've heard that before. (laughs) But so do you hear how I milestoned you back though? Yes. Beginning struggle, tipping point, new beginning. I gave you all that back. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now what you, you smiled when I shared that back to you. Why? It was accurate. It made me feel good that Mm -hmm. you listened to my story. Right. Yeah. Right. And so that's the power of that. And that's a rare experience. And what did you know? I wasn't just chatting in and out of my kitchen and just saying, yeah, yeah, I actually connected with yeah. you. It mattered. And I was able to feed it back. Now, I can do that with having a 35 or whatever break between hand because I'm I'm an Olympic athlete. But if we think in the map, we can do this and we can practice our way to that success. Got it. In terms of doing it, that's more powerful than so. You said you, your parents owned a restaurant. You know, <laughs> that's just more powerful if I tell you your own story back to you. And this is different from affirming the understanding. This is so I didn't affirm yet. Okay. So okay. want me to show you how to do that? First, we're going to take one more break to thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back to cover the last two tools in the bag. Sure. We're back. So we're in the tool bag. Yes, the backpack. So the backpack, and in the backpack we have the map. Um, I didn't get the 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 short, the, um, shorter version for number two, utilizing the six most powerful questions. The, so the map and the stops in the book is one tool. Okay. 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 Uh, so we covered that. Yes, but there are two things on the map. There's the main path and there's the four stops. Got it. Main okay. path. Four stops. So it's stops. one A, one B. Then we covered the flashlight. Then we covered the compass, which are the six most powerful I'm a questions. Horrible student. That's I'm all like, right. You just did such a good job listening, and now I'm just throwing this all over the place back at you. And then we're about to get into. Wait, we covered. Uh, then we did the flashlight. That flashlight. Yep. And now we're about to do affirming uh, understanding, which is the. To which tool is that in the back? That's called the water filter. The water filter. So why is it called the water filter? So when you're in the woods, you can't carry enough water. That's that's safe. Because it's contaminated. You've got to take a water filter with you. So metaphorically, we contaminate all the conversations that we are in because we have this thing, as you said, called the subconscious brain that tells us our own story. So we are constantly filling in our own thoughts or feelings in the midst of things when we're listening. So I may contaminate your story, and I need to let, I need to affirm or, or affirm that I haven't done that. Okay. So when I, what, how the water filter looks is, I just told you your story, you smiled, but I need to ask, do I get you, right? So when I say, do I get you, one of three things are going to happen. You're going to say yes, and you're going to mean yes, like I think that's what happened. You're going to say yes, and then you're going to start telling me more. Yeah, well, which is funny because wh- I think you asked, you started smiling, why did you start to smile? And uh, I think I told you that the reason I became a crunch pilot is because I wanted to go, I wanted to get away, I wanted to travel. Another big part of that was because I was also told I couldn't do it. Ah, so well, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to prove people wrong. It was, yeah. it was, uh, it was more about showing huh. people I, I was capable of, of doing it. Uh, but then I got there, I did it, and I was like, why the hell am I here? Oh, right, <laughs> right. It was more accomplishing and feeling that yeah, feeling. Yeah, like I checked the box, and then yeah. I was just like, I am not where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And yeah. You know, $200,000 later in investing in my college wow. career, you know, big mistake. Wow. Um, yeah. So that's so why that's I an, But that's an important <laughs> part of the story for you. Is right. it not? Now, if I hadn't asked, do I get you? Would have I ever gotten that from you? <clears throat> no, no. Yeah. Which is what happens all day long. Yep. So we think we, under, by the way, I'm going to give, so there's nothing that makes me feel less understood than when t- someone tells me I understand. <laughs> 
if you say, yeah, yeah, I understand, I go, "Mm -mm, never feel less understood. What I want is for you to tell me what I said at, at a high level on those stops and then ask me, do I get you? Which is, do I understand yeah. you? And if you say affirmatively, yes, yeah, or I say in this case, then I, then we're in a different paradigm. Even if we, this is not about agreement, by the way. This is about understanding. You and I may not agree on an issue, but I can understand where you are, and you can understand where I am. That's two totally different things. Got it. The last um, tool in the backpack is mini reflecting. That's right, and we call those the footprints. So they're the footprints because what happens on a hike is sometimes the hiker will get ahead um, and we need to slow them down a little bit. So when you're new to this, especially, you need to stay together on the the path and the hiker's all gonna get lost in the woods because they're not great storytellers. So when we mini reflect, which is what you were getting at when you heard the sixth compass tool, which is it sounds like you feel, take off the feel it sounds like, and fill in the blank is what we call uh, the the footprints or a mini reflection. So it sounds like it wasn't only that you you know wanted to not be in the restaurant business. You also wanted to prove people wrong that you couldn't achieve this. Yeah. It, do I get you? Yeah. And you know, honestly, uh, the lesson there was that the people that were trying to guide me were right. They weren't saying you can't do this. They were saying you shouldn't right. do this. You didn't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I didn't filter their message. That's right. You <laughs> contaminated it with your own story. saved myself $200,000. So let me see if I get you. So let me go back to you were a kid that always felt like the one who couldn't as an, a dyslexic that was s- telling themselves they were stupid and, and didn't belong. And so this was a moment where you could say, no, I'm capable. I, I can do this. Look at me. And and what you realized is, you know what? I just I just filtered it wrong. I feel naked right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so people think I've analyzed them in some ways. Yeah. But all I did was listen to everything you said. And yeah. I, I didn't I didn't I didn't have to conjure that up. Yeah. Those are all words you actually fed to me. I just I just pieced it together on the map, which is what you're doing all day as, as, as you do these interviews. So that's why it looks like magic, but it's not. Subconscious is paying attention. I mean, it's the, it's the conscious and the sub, like right. all the little clues are there, and it brings it to the surface at the end. And people will tell you if you ask. Yeah. yeah. They will tell you, but it is your job to make sure that you're imp- – I'm imprinting where you were in your story. So you, as a dyslexic, because we talked about that's the beginning – then I know your struggle was partially I felt stupid. The tipping point is I'll show you wrong. Your insight, your new beginning, or what you learned is people didn't tell me no. They said I shouldn't, yeah. <laughs> not I couldn't. <laughs> yeah. So I'm on the map. I'm just I'm just putting the piece. I'm Rubik's cubing yeah. the, the conversation. But I will say in all that that challenge, because it was a super challenge. Imagine you're somebody who's dyslexic. Yes. Now go get your pilot license. Yes, or your pen degree. Right. Um, it's amazing. I, I don't did. relate to this story at all. But, but I mean, it's <laughs> very math and science heavy. Absolutely. And I do oh enjoy, my. I do enjoy science. I do yeah. enjoy understanding how things work. Yeah. Don't make me fill out the equation to get to the answer. But like, I like the big picture. Yeah. I like understanding how things work. Yeah. Right? I'm good. As do at, I. I'm good at seeing the big picture. Mm-hmm. I'm good at understanding how things work. Uh, I'm not good at developing the equation to figure out, you know. But you can follow the equation. I'm no, I'm no Einstein when it comes to that. Yeah, type of thing. but you can follow the equation. Exactly. Well, that so now you're talking about the emotional intelligence of how you got to be a pilot, which is how I succeeded at Penn. S- then that's exact. So where I was going with this is it's through my trials and tribulations and challenges of tr- of of doing the thing I wasn't meant to do. That's right. That dis- that helped me discover the thing I was meant to do. That's right. The reason why I became a commercial the, re- the the well, not the reason why but why I I was able to pass is yeah. because people liked me. Yeah, I get <laughs> you. Yeah, you know, and they they're like. You know, you're not the best at this, but like we like you, so like we're gonna work with well, you. Well, we'll work with you. You yeah. made people want to. Co- That's the influence part, by the way. Yeah. So you just described influence. Oh damn it! I am. Do so you feel naked man. again? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, but but I think there's something to be said in like doing hard things. Or you know, it, you might waste time and energy and money, but you will learn so much about yourself and what you should be doing. That's right. Um, and I think I, I I have my my pilot career to. To, uh, stripping all my weaknesses helped yeah. me. Like I, I, I got by on my strengths. Yep. You know, so it wasn't and, all gloom and doom. And and what I'll tell you is that most people have that. That's their story, and most of us share that. That's the other thing we have in common. We don't 
why we do what we do shows up very early and things interfere with how to get there. So, so while that's, it's the snowflake syndrome, right? Your story is unique and it's also the same as everybody else's. We all follow that path to some degree. One of the things we do is, is help people be able to tell that story of why they do what they do. Yeah. Because it's when you understand that you get people to buy into you. So, you know, some people, I, we have a guy that's like, we always say you have one word to describe why you do what you do and mine's understanding, right? His was tools. And it's because, you know, his dad put a, you know, a hammer in his, his hand at two years old. What he does for a pharma company f is for surgeons is he gives the tools that his team needs so that he can develop those tools for the surgeons. There's yeah. a direct correlation between the two. Christine, I've really loved this conversation. Yeah. We've covered all the tools uh, in, in, our, in our, our bag um, and we've learned the benefits of listening and why we should. We know more about you and your story. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, but before we say goodbye, is there anything that hasn't come out of today's conversation? Things that you were hoping we would discuss that we did not discuss that our listeners should hear? Um, well, there's, look, this is a, a lot of topic, right, As you, with all your listeners. So I think what I'd like to emphasize is this is a skill. This isn't, this is a skill that needs to be developed. So it is, it does take the, it takes the right help or the right tools, and then it takes the practice. The good news is there's all kinds of practice. You can do it with your Uber driver. You can do it in the grocery store with your loved ones. But this is about skill development. So our mission, my mission, is really to create a listening movement mm. where we, we pivot the paradigm. We shift it from telling, talking, knowing to resource and education being put on listening. So our, that's, that's our listening mission. And my hope is that we're going to start to educate kids with a listening path starting at a very young age so that they learn to ski at five instead of 35, 45, <laughs> 55, um, because it's easier when you're on the mountain or in the woods at a younger age. And this is something that has just not been attended to. Yeah, do you have a course around, how, have, you, have you put together a course, a step-by-step -step process to listening? We so we currently teach organizations, we work with all small to large organizations with teaching them the skill of listening, and it's called the listening path. And these are the five foundational tools, but we there's many other tools that we also teach. These are just the first five. And um, and our and we already do that, and we've been doing that for years. Um, and what we're doing more and more is trying to make this replicable and scalable. So I think I mentioned we're, we're in the process of developing a game yeah. where we'll be able to teach young kids as well as, um, you know, as continue to teach uh, businesses and high schoolers and above how to listen. I think it's going to get louder. I'm going to pause here for a second. I think it might. Izzy was oh, chunky. He's, he's on your, your uh, back patio. Oh, well, no wonder. <laughs> we are at Christine's residence. <laughs> In case you weren't sure. The oh, look at that. The land, land crew here I didn't have any. I have talented. no visibility into when they're coming. Yeah. You're There's a, the pool out back. I don't know. Uh, I was like, Jared's good. He's a, he's a pro. He'll figure out, He'll figure out where to He'll chop it. Yeah. Can I say a swear word? Not a speak of time, right? I mean, sure. No, I, I, you know. I, I swear. He's probably heard a few times of it. Yeah. This What's your favorite food? Um, I love. That's a hard one for somebody. It really that. is. Um, what kind of restaurant? Let's go back. What kind of restaurant did your parents have? It was like a comfort food restaurant, okay. like breakfast and yep. lunch, and like just like you know, like pancakes flopping over okay. the side of the the, the plate, cheese steaks, uh, or we're, we're in Philadelphia. Steak and cheese is what I would say back. Cheese oh, steaks, yeah, so cheese steaks right, is I, what we say around yeah, here. Yeah. I'm a um, fan of the cheesesteak egg roll. That's my new personal ooh, favorite. Nice. Have I'm you had those around here? No, I haven't, okay. but uh, I have had one before. Um, they're delicious. Yeah, I've heard they're good. Uh, my, I, You know, I love, I think everyone loves pizza, right? Yes. But I can't eat it like I used to. I like, know. So for me, it's like it's got to be like a once in an occasion. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Usually when I'm on the road, I can have a couple slices. Yeah. My favorite thing to make is calzones. Oh, okay. And I've always had a, a dream of opening my own like artisanal calzone shop where wow. like, we put all the energy, we give the love to the calzone. Pizza's an afterthought. Wow. So why not do the podcast and the cut? Why well, people have to come to you? That's harder. In, in my. In you my do the podcast while they serve them calzones, oh, right? right? Someday. I mean, I think as the podcast continues to grow, I as I have leverage. Yeah, sure. You know, as I and I'm, I'm actually at that point where people have said, like, well, I can come to you because yeah. usually my first like reason why like I, I say no to people is like, hey, like I can't do a, right. a, a digital interview. It's one of the reasons. And I also let my guests hear the show. So I'm not saying no. I'm just trying to remove myself right. from the process. Right. And they're like, well, I'll come to you. And I'm like, shit. 
<laughs> nice. The, they take it away, right? Yeah. yeah that's good. <laughs> but I'm like, well, you still weren't referred. Sorry. <laughs> but if you are, I'll be, I'll be, you. I'll be real quick to call you. That's so, interesting. You know, yeah. But I think we can probably. Okay. Do you remember what the last thing you said um, was? We were talking about the listening mission. So do you want me just to like. So I asked if there was anything you wanted to talk about. You were talking about um, the children, how it's important to get them using educated early. Educating. Just take it from there, so it's easier to, sure. easier to edit. Sure. So, so our mission is to create that that we have that listening mission to create the movement where we're educating kids younger. So that's we want to we want to create that movement because that's the paradigm that needs to change. So we're solving that problem, but we currently work with businesses. Um, and we help all kinds of organizations of all sizes to learn to listen differently. Got it. And if we were inspired by you today, and maybe we want to connect with you, hire you to coach us on mm-hmm. how to become a better listener, which is such an amazing leadership skill. Yeah. That if you are title of director of operations, CEO, GM, whatever it might Restaurant be, owner, business, absolutely. Like invest in yourself. At the very least, go pick up this book. What is it costing you not to listen? The the power of understanding to connect, influence, solve, and sell. But what if we already know we want to work with you? What's the best way to get it? Well, they can find me on social media at the listening guide. That's the listening guide. And the website is equipped because we equip people with the listening skills. So it's EQ U-I-P-T dash people dot com. Beautiful. Uh, and one thing we do here at Restaurant Unstoppable is we always call somebody out. Yeah. So it could be a restaurant operator, but honestly, I'm super passionate about learning more about how to be a better like human, improve your own personal skills and mm-hmm. mental skills. So maybe it's somebody in the, in the world of psychology that you respect, a subject that you Wow. Well it's such a, I should have given that some more thought. I didn't um, give you much opportunity. That's okay. That. That's all right. Yeah. Um, you know, I... Th- <laughs> So this is going to be different than what you're thinking. I, th- I always think the answers are within. So I would encourage you to turn to the person that you spend the most time with because <laughs> they're the ones who really have the most to share with you if you're willing to listen to it. So if you really want to be impacted by somebody, we're, we, we look so far much outside of our, I- our own worlds when mo- our own worlds have the biggest impact. So ask your three-year-old for <laughs> what do they think or ask them a question about yourself or what does daddy do well or what does mommy do well and that's the best coaching you're going to get if you ask the people that love you the most I think is kind of the biggest thing you can do you know it's funny because I mentioned I might be trying to get my parents on the show for the thousandth episode so that would be very cool right that so. would be I mean I I'm all for a lot of advice and a lot of people that you know but um the the people that have helped me the most are the ones that care about me the most. So, um, yeah, I think if we just kind of, it's if we just kind of go to the people that love us, let them love us by telling us what we do well or what we could do better. Christine, I've loved this conversation. Thank you so much. If you enjoyed today's episode and you want to check out the show notes, head over to restaurantunstoppable.com slash 980. 89 i want to say i'm wow. pretty sure if it's I've not 889 it's 80 and it's 990 that's very one incredible of those congratulations <laughs> thank to you, you. that's amazing thank you very much it's been a blast honestly i've loved every second thank you for it. putting up with all the distractions as well the pleasure was mine honestly this was a treat thank you there is no questioning you are unstoppable <laughs> thank you cheers